The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hi, Sammy Shah here. Just a quick note to say that the following interview was recorded shortly before the recent airstrikes launched against Israeli targets directly from Iran. Nevertheless, I believe you'll find the contents remain entirely pertinent to understanding current Iranian security and defense strategies. That said, on with the show. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. Proxy warfare, it's in the name. It's about conducting military operations. It's about achieving interests. And sometimes those interests change very drastically, particularly when it comes to the proxy themselves. They can shift, they can do a complete 180 and then bite the hand that feeds them. The Iranian public sees Iranian investment in Hezbollah, in Hamas, as counterproductive and detrimental to Iranian national interests, especially when Iran is under sanctions and needs the money for its own economy. So there is a clear gap between the public and the Iranian leadership that pursues these proxy relationships. In this episode... Iran's strategy of outsourcing warfare in the Middle East. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. For decades, Iran has skillfully employed a network of proxy militant groups across the broader Middle East to project power and advance its interests, while maintaining an impression of plausible deniability on the global stage. From Lebanon to Yemen, from Iraq to the Palestinian territories, Tehran has either partnered with or helped create militia forces that, while driven by their own individual goals, are united in their opposition to Western and Israeli influence in the region. At its core lies a forward defence strategy, pushing away or preempting threats from Iranian soil. Serving as both sword and shield, the sponsoring of proxies works to undermine rivals while avoiding the full costs of direct warfare. Yet, while this approach prioritizes security, it also carries risks. Proxies can pursue their own brutal or corrupt agendas at odds with Iran's interests. Interests between patron and proxy may diverge, and bankrolling militancy long-term imposes financial strain. As conflicts in the region have intensified in recent months with the Israel-Gaza war, from the Iran-backed Houthis attacks to militia violence against the US in Iraq, key questions arise. How much does Iran truly control these forces? How sustainable is outsourcing warfare via proxies? And what are the risks for Tehran of miscalculation sparking a wider conflagration? To discuss, I'm joined today by Professor Sharam Akbarzadeh, Research Professor of Middle East and Central Asian Politics at Deakin University, who's written extensively on political processes and conflict in the Middle East, and by international relations expert Dr. Andrew Thomas, also from Deakin University. Andrew's just put out a new book which relates to our topic today. It's titled Iran and the West, a non-Western approach to foreign policy, published by Routledge. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Sharam and Andrew. Thanks for having us. Thank you. The notion of proxy warfare in pursuit of strategic and military aims certainly isn't new and may well be as old as armed conflict itself. Yet since the end of World War II, it's become the most preferred tool of nation states for fighting wars. Before we look at Iran's use of proxy groups, let's briefly examine the larger dynamics of using proxies in military engagement. Sharam, while it may seem obvious to some, let's ask this question anyway. Why do nation states, which themselves may have substantial military resources, choose proxy strategies over direct engagement? Well, thanks for the question and thanks for having me, Sami. Um, as you mentioned, it's a very old practice and it makes sense if you don't want to be involved in direct conflict, direct confrontation, you pay off allies, pay off proxies to engage in warfare and um, deter threats and deter attacks on your territory without being directly embroiled in conflict. So even empires, for example, paid off various tribes that were in the periphery of the empire to fight off enemies, 
and you know to deter attack. So it's a very old strategy, and in many ways it's economic. It's very cost effective because you don't have to maintain a fully fledged army and engage, bring, utilize your own army all the time for any attack, any threat that may materialize. You can have your uh, proxies beyond your borders dealing with a threat. So it makes sense. It's become a lot more common in, as you mentioned, in the um, modern times, because it also adds a level of deniability. States can sponsor proxies to do things that they wouldn't want to do themselves. So deniability, they can keep themselves at arm's length and um, not get their hands dirty, so to speak. Andrew, is a shared ideology, a shared identity, any aspect of this kind of proxy strategy? Um, yes. Sometimes it can be overstated, but I think in a lot of cases it is about sort of exporting ideology in a broader context, particularly in insecure contexts, and not always for ideological outcomes, but for, for potential security outcomes as well. You mentioned that these states often have substantial military resources, which is true. However, in international politics, uh, substantial is kind of relative, and particularly in, in modern times, states often have asymmetric levels of power. For example, in the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong fought a very specific way against the United States. They couldn't fight them head on. So they fought them with guerrilla warfare. Proxy warfare kind of has the same purpose as you might have substantial military resources to an extent, but the actual calculations on the battlefield mean that you would lose in all that warfare. Proxy warfare, coupled with what Chakram said about plausible deniability, about creating this illusion of, of peacetime, it is actually a quite an effective way at fighting much more powerful armies as well. So there's the ideological element, but it is also primarily strategic, as you said in the opening quite well, that it's forward defense. It's more about the international game of chess rather than about ideology. Sharam, you've mentioned some advantages like projecting power and influence without an all-out war being involved, an illusion of a country at peace can be maintained, and of course, plausible deniability being the biggest one. Those are the upsides of a proxy strategy. What are the potential downsides and risks of choosing proxy strategies then? Well, there are quite a few, uh, Sami. All you have to do is to look at what Pakistan has done with the Taliban. Pakistani military force has helped create the Taliban in its early days, bolstered Taliban. Of course, from Pakistani point of view, Taliban were going to serve the national interest of Pakistan. Taliban was going to go into Afghanistan, push over the various Mujahideen groups, maintain some level of control and tranquility over Afghanistan, and then be an ally of Pakistan. So give Pakistani armed forces, strategic depth, so to speak. So that was the language and thinking behind Pakistan's choice of supporting Taliban. Of course, the Taliban have not come back to wipe the hand that fed them. The Taliban has become a headache for Pakistan. So you can't always control your proxies. You develop a proxy relationship, but proxies are not always taking orders from you. Mostly they do, but they have, they can be their own person and they can decide for themselves what serves their interests. And they can break away from you. And now that Taliban, in this case, is in power, they are really having a go at uh, Pakistan. So it become a headache for Pakistan security. Proxies don't always follow the line that's set by the patron. They can do things that embroil and drag the patron into direct confrontation. Well, then, before we get to Iran, one final question, I suppose, is what is the difference between a proxy and an ally? How is one thing a relationship that is so symbiotic and another is so common in the world, and yet we don't link them as the same thing? Why is proxy and ally such a differentiated category? Andrew? My view is that a proxy is a tool, an ally is much more of a relationship. So a proxy 
the patron state would see them much more like a a gun than someone that they're actually have a relationship with. So a, a tool that's effective for achieving a goal. Now there's a scale of that relationship. Um, and again, um, the relationship between Iran and Hezbollah, for example, is very different between the relationship between Iran and Hamas. They're quite different and they have different levels of control over them and different sort of connections to their policies. But the fact of the matter remains that proxy warfare, it's in the name. It's about conducting military operations. It's about achieving interests. The shared element of interest is almost unimportant in a lot of cases. And as Shakram talked about with the Taliban, sometimes those interests change very drastically, particularly when it comes to the proxy themselves. They can shift, they can do a complete 180 and then bite the hand that feeds them directly. And that creates a lot of risk. But there's there's a calculation there about how much risk, how risk averse the patron state is to what can happen. So I think that it is an asymmetric relationship in that regard as well, not just in terms of a power relationship, but in terms of how these groups are seen by the patron state. They're seen as a tool rather than as a partner or an ally. So let's stop teasing the topic. Let's get into Iran and its proxy states and its proxy relationships then. Let's focus where we want to. Uh, Before we go any further, actually, Sharam, can you give us just a brief overview of what we are talking about when we say Iran and its proxies. How many proxies are there? Who are the big ones? And then we can talk about them individually in, in greater detail. Okay. Uh, how long do we have, Sami? <laughs> Maybe a few days. Let's just go from there. Iran has established a lot of proxies in the region, typically with Shia militia groups, Shia paramilitary groups. You know, in Iraq, there are a number of them. The most famous one, uh, actually, uh, and the very first one was in Lebanon with Hezbollah, which is a direct result of Iranian intervention. Hezbollah emerged out of Iranian investment in creating a fighting force to resist Israel. And the term axis of resistance really refers back to the history of emergence of Hezbollah to push back against Israeli occupation. And then you have Houthis in Yemen, a number of small groups that were recruited by Iranian authorities from Shia Pakistanis and Shia Afghans who were then sent to Syria to engage in the civil war conflict in Syria. There's a long list. The point I want to highlight here is that they're all Shia And this has been a problem for Iran because Iran presents itself as the champion of Muslim interests, not Shia interests. And that is why Hamas comes into the picture and Iran has invested significantly in supporting Hamas. Hamas not being a Shia group. Hamas not being a Shia group. Hamas belonging to Sunni sect. Absolutely. Hamas is an offshoot of Muslim Brotherhood which is a political Islamist organization and ideology in Egypt and uh, Levant, basically. So Iran had an image problem of being a sectarian power. And Hamas saved Iran from that image problem by joining the group, being a Sunni organization, a Sunni population. Hamas represented the Sunni sect. And it gave a lot of credibility to Iranian claims that they were representing the whole Muslim Ummah, the nation of Muslims, and not just Shia, when they were talking about access of resistance, when they were talking about uh, building up resistance against Israeli occupation or resisting U.S. domination, that this was a Muslim project, not a Shia project. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, especially in the idea that that Iran has had this real problem, particularly within Iraq, about sort of being viewed as this very, very cynical chess player inside Iraq. So the the Bader organization, for example, effectively being set up by Iranian intelligence officers in the IRGC, the influence of Muqtada al-Sada initially, um, Iraqis for a long time, and obviously still today, given a lot of the unrest over the last two years, 
see Iran as kind of this pretty cynical Shia force. And yeah, Hamas, at least in theory, is an attempt to kind of address that. And whether or not that's actually convincing Muslims in places like Iraq and Yemen and Syria and, and you know, even beyond Egypt, Saudi Arabia, it's difficult to tell at this stage. So let's then talk about the way Iran does this recruitment and management of its proxy groups. Is there a specific organization within Iran whose role it is to handle proxies, find proxies and maintain proxies? Or is this something that's more widespread part of the government network overall, Andrew? So broadly, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or the IRGC, is tasked with those sorts of operations. But within the IRGC, there is a group called the Al-Quds Force, which has become famous over the last few years, since 2022, due to the death of Qasem Soleimani, who was killed by the Trump administration on his way to Iraq to meet with Shia groups in Iraq. The Quds Force operates in a variety of different ways. As was shown by Qasem Soleimani, quite a lot of high-level officials actually travel across lines to meet with high-level members of these groups, meet with politicians, meet with forces that align their interests. But they also conduct a lot of remote communication. They transport weapons. They set up manufacturing for weapons locally, or they provide training to do so. Uh, That's in places like Gaza with Hamas, that's, there's, it's obviously not possible or very difficult for Iranian officials to travel there. Uh, so they build capacity within those organizations or wire transfer money or create contexts for intelligence to be shared, that sort of thing. But in contexts like Hezbollah and in Iraq, quite often you'll have direct contact between the Al-Quds and these organizations. So, Sharam, when we see Iran's attempts at expanding its influence, as we've all described it over here, should we see that as a expansionist policy or is that a defensive policy? Is Iran seeking to you know, increase its presence in the Middle East region or is it just seeking to protect itself better through a you know, offense is the best defense approach? Depends who you ask, Sami. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say we ask uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, what would he say? <laughs> Uh, Iran presents its strategy as defensive. Everything is presented in terms of national defense. Patronage of proxy actors is seen as a form of forward defense and a form of deterring attacks. And um, on many occasions, Khamenei and various members of leadership have referred to Hezbollah and other proxies in the region to deter attacks. They have warned the US, for example, during the tension when tensions were very high during Trump's administration, um, tension in the Persian Gulf. Repeatedly, authorities in Iran said to the Americans, if you push really hard, and if you interfere in our affairs, if you threaten us in the Persian Gulf, you will be hit elsewhere, clearly referring to what Iran can do in Lebanon and elsewhere in the Middle East via its proxies. So Iran has not shied away from referring to its proxies as a form of Damocles sword that Iran would use it if it's pushed to the edge. And it's important to note that Hezbollah has also been very vocal in saying, if Iran is attacked, we will retaliate. They don't even have to wait for an order from the supreme leader. They're just ready to hit back at Iran's enemies if Iran is attacked. So Iran sees this as a form of deterrence and a defensive mechanism. But you have a classic case of a security dilemma here where Iran sees its actions as defensive, but everyone else around it sees it as really threatening and aggressive and power projection. So that's why we have this ratchet effect of tensions always rising with no way of bringing tensions down. We often talk about Iran's history changing in the 1979 Islamic Revolution and the modern Iran that we know very much being a result of that one period. Is the current cultivation of militant proxies an example of Iran attempting to export the 1979 Islamic Revolution to see more of that spreading in the region? I think that's part of it. 
ideally, Iran would love to see Iraq have a Shia revolution. Uh, it'd love to see Yemen have a Shia revolution. It supports the Shia minority in Syria, the, the Alawites. It would love to see a Shia revolution in the Muslim world, for sure. Its immediate goals are not that, but since the Islamic revolution, there's obviously been a significant shift in the position that Iran sees itself in the world. During the Shah, it was very much a international society affirming state, which is a nice way of saying very friendly with the United States, very friendly with Europe, effectively. That has obviously changed. It's considered a revisionist state. It's considered a state that rejects the global order. And as a result, it rejects a lot of the principles of sort of international order in the region that don't uphold its own interests. And as a result, I think there's a bit more desperation in terms of its defense policy, which is why it's employing a forward defense policy. It's effectively encircled. It sees itself as being encircled by enemies, kind of similar to Russia's position in global politics, and tries to project more power than it has as a result. Now, Shahram's touched on how that can actually cause some problems in terms of the security dilemma, which is this idea that one state in an effort to secure itself makes the states around it more, and particularly its adversaries, more insecure. As a specific example, what's happening with the Houthis at the moment, where they're capturing shipping vessels, where they're, you know, they recently have actually killed crew of ships, that's now hitting the Western world where it hurts. And it now becomes actually easier for the Western world to justify some kind of retaliation against Iran specifically, because those dots are connected, because it's quite clear that Iran is involved with the Houthis. Though I think it's often overestimated to what extent, as we've talked about before, it doesn't control them, but it is aligned with their interests. And that can actually play the opposite effect of a deterrent. If you go too far, then the United States can say, well, you're actually threatening our economic interests in terms of ships being able to travel through the Suez Canal. That's a non-negotiable. We will actually go quite far in terms of protecting those interests. So it is a very, very risky game to play. Very risky. So let's look then at the Houthis, the, the Houthi forces in Yemen. Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea have certainly been in the headlines over the past few months in the aftermath of the 7th of October 2023 attacks on Israel by Hamas militants. They've also been engaged in a decade-long conflict ongoing with Saudi Arabia with devastating humanitarian impact. Notably, the Houthi are often referred to in the Western media as Iran-backed or an Iranian proxy. So, Sharam, can you help us unpack the actual relationship between Iran and the Houthis? The very first thing I have to say here is that um, the relationship between Iran and Houthis and various other proxies is not based on religious affinity. In Syria, Iran's ally, Bashar al-Assad regime, is not Shia. It's an Alawite community. And the Alawite community is not the same branch of Islam as the 12 Imam Shia that is dominant in Iran. In fact, any other time, Alawites would be scolded and dismissed as heretics in Iran. Same thing with the Zaydis in Yemen, the Houthis. They are not Shia according to 12 Imam Shia dominant theology in Iran. They are heretics. <laughs> so there is no sectarian, there is no kind of religious foundation for this relationship. But there are Iran proxies slash allies. Iran obviously saw in Houthis a potential ally when they started fighting the government that was close to Saudi Arabia. And Iran saw supporting for the Houthi opposition as a way of undermining Saudi domination of Yemen and undermining Saudi control, basically, on the region. So that's why Iran got involved in supporting the Houthis. And this is way before everything blew out in Gaza. And now, of course, Yemen is under blockade. Very uh, limited amount of arms and support can get through the blockade to Yemen. So uh, we can't assume that the Houthis are being armed 
by Iran at the moment, but there were definitely arms shipped and delivered to Houthis in the past. And as Andrew mentioned, Iran engaged in capacity building projects to help and allow the Houthis to build their own drones, build their own missiles. And they seem to have been very good at it now because they can manufacture their own drones and missiles and hit targets in Saudi Arabia, even try to hit Israeli territory. So um, the relationship while started from Iranian point of view as a way of managing Saudi control and Saudi influence has now evolved into some form of a partnership. It's difficult to see Houthis being responsive to Iranian command. It's very unlikely that Iran would have asked Houthis to strike Israeli territory by missile. I doubt that Iranians would have ordered the attacks on ships in the Red Sea. It's doubtful. It's hard to know. The information doesn't come by easily from Iran. But you can assume that the Houthis have made this decision, have seen these actions as consistent with the overall objective of challenging Israeli actions in Gaza and are acting by it. So you mentioned that Iran does not, in normal circumstances, see the Zaydi Shias, which is what the Houthis are, as a legitimate form of Shia belief. So is the conflict then between Iran and Saudi Arabia not a Shia versus Sunni one? Are we to assume that that kind of summation of the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia is actually shallow and inaccurate? A simple yes. <laughs> a simple yes. I mean, uh, that is not a religious or a sectarian conflict. I'm going to let Andrew respond to that question because I see him poised to say something, but that's my contribution. <laughs> well, I was about to say an emphatic yes, too. I talked a little bit about this in my book, but Iran kind of likes to focus on sect when it helps them. But in this case, sort of religiously, they actually have a lot less in common with the Zaydis than they do with with other branches of Shia. And as um, Shahram says, they're often seen as kind of apostates or heretics in terms of the Twelver school of Shia Islam. But it's quite clear that if you look at when Iran starts giving support to the Houthis, it's in relation to kind of a power posture in Saudi Arabia of retaliating to Iranian expansion. So again, getting back to that kind of security dilemma conversation, it's quite clear that Iran is trying through Yemen to balance out Saudi power in the region, but also given the fact that it's quite a staunch US ally, trying to undermine US interests in the region as well at the same time. So it's constantly looking at these different levels. Often it will it will say, oh, it's like, oh, um, sure, there's Aedi Shia, but they're still Shia to kind of justify it. But as Shafram says, it's kind of meaningless given how different their belief systems actually are. That's more kind of a rhetorical justification, maybe even for a domestic audience. But again, it depends on who you ask with all this stuff. Some people really emphasize that kind of sheer crescent fear that, that Saudi Arabia has and that maybe Saudi Arabia perceives a much closer connection between Iran and these rebel groups that are Shia. But, but again, it's quite clear that this is more of a geopolitical stoush than it is anything else. Well, Sharam also mentioned the Houthis and the attacks on ships in the aftermath of October 7th. How have the ties between the Houthis and Iran then been affected by the Israel-Hamas war? Are they stronger or now are the Houthis seen as more independent of Iran? Uh, Andrew? Well, I would say that the Gaza conflict has done wonders for the Houthi rebels in terms of their legitimacy. In some papers, I've actually read or seen them described as the government in Yemen. It's actually much more disputed than that. There's actually two centers of power that claim to control Yemen, but they're often referred to as a Yemen fighting force, which for a subnational group, for a rebel force, that's the holy grail. That's something that they can only dream of in a lot of cases. Also, a significant amount of support sub-state, obviously, in the West for their actions as kind of this, quote-unquote, activist group, put that in inverted commas, given that, you know, they've obviously got their own interests, got their own political horses in this race. But in a context where the Western world is not doing much to address the atrocities in Gaza, 
it's giving the Houthi rebels quite a lot of legitimacy. And in a lot of cases, some analysts don't even care that they're strongly linked to Iran or have these strong links to Iran. They are putting significant pressure on the West where it hurts economically and trying to, at least on paper, change the outcome of the war. Can I jump in here, Sami, just on the same point? Everything that Andrew said, you can refer it to Iran, and it works just as well. For years, Iran has been saying that we are the only people who are standing up to Israel, the only one who is standing up to U.S. arrogance. We're supporting the axis of resistance, various proxy actors, and we speak for Muslim interests, Shia and Sunni Muslim interests, the interests of the Ummah. So this has been the message. They were very critical of countries like UAE and Bahrain who signed the Abraham Accord with Israel, and they saw it as betraying the Palestinians, betraying the Muslim cause. And they were very critical of Saudi Arabia when it sent signals that it might also join the Abraham Accord and normalize relations with Israel. So this has been Iran's position. And all of a sudden, everything Iran said has come true. You know, Israel is bombarding Gaza, has no respect for international law, 32,000 people dead, most of them civilians, about 15,000 children dead. And the UN has been ineffective because the US continues to veto all Security Council resolutions, except the last one, which remains to be seen if it has teeth. So the whole international system, as Iran argued for decades, the whole international system is rigged to serve US interests, and Israel is benefiting from that. And Iran, as from, you know, by their account, was the only country standing up for Muslim interests. This has brought Iran so much credibility in Arab streets, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Arab world. The ordinary person in the street thinks very highly of Iran because Iran has stood up to power. This is big. The Houthis are basking in the same kind of glory as Iran is. There is so much history behind it. We don't want to spend time on it. But Iran is benefiting from this dynamic. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Air to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sami Shah and I'm joined by Middle East observers Dr. Andrew Thomas and Professor Sharam Akbarzadeh. We're talking about Iran and its militia proxy network in the Middle East. Some would argue that the Houthis don't really represent a proxy force in the way Hezbollah, based in southern Lebanon, does. But Andrew, can you elaborate a little bit on the Hezbollah's relationship with Tehran? Well, as, as Shah Ram said, Hezbollah is primarily started as a way for Iran to combat Israeli interests right at the border. And as a result... Tehran's got gotten their money's worth out of that, they would say. And you can tell by how much they invest in Hezbollah. Hezbollah is, as you say, very substantively different from pretty much every other proxy that Iran has and is the closest thing they actually have to an extension of the IRGC or the Quds Force elsewhere in, in the region. We often talk about what a second front in this Gaza war would look like if it opened up in, you know, south of the Latani River in Lebanon. And the difference is Israel quite often says, oh, we would crush Hezbollah like we would Hamas. Probably not. Uh, Hezbollah is a much different beast to Hamas. They are effectively an extension of the Iranian military. And that's why I said earlier, Hezbollah is much more like an ally to Iran than it is like a tool. 
they see themselves as on the same political and religious page. And they also have a different level of legitimacy in Lebanon as well. They're part of the confessional parliament in Lebanon as a political group and have a much more cohesive structure, a much more unitary ideological structure than something like Hamas, which is not a sort of very homogenous group at all. It's got all sorts of different beliefs and views on how to deal with Israel, how to liberate the Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry to interrupt there, but you described them as uh, seeing themselves as allies of Iran, yet there's also the description many have made of them as a very direct proxy of Iran. Is there a level of autonomy in Hezbollah decision making or are they very much having to run every major decision by Iran, get Iran's permission before they move forward? There is a level of autonomy there. However, they're relying on this kind of being on the same ideological page. And that comes down to, again, we were talking about the difference between sort of 12 Shiism and Zayedi, the Zayedi Shia in, in Yemen. Again, because there's the Hezbollah in Lebanon are effectively the same sect as the Iranians, there is a lot of confluence of goals in terms of spreading the Walid al faqi sort of the, this idea of the Islamic jurist consult being the sort of the person or the emissary for political life and religious life on earth is something that Hezbollah are aligned with Iran on and exporting that where they can, or at least implementing it in Lebanon. So yes, there is autonomy. And like other proxy groups, it's difficult to imagine that someone on the Quds Force is constantly on the phone directing them exactly where to strike in, in sort of northern Israel, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a lot of coordination there as well. Shara? And I just want to reinforce the message, the point that Andrew made. Hezbollah is quite complex, uh, just like Hamas. It's not just a military force. It's also a political actor in the national politics of Lebanon. They are present in the Lebanese power structure based on the voting process. So um, it's a political entity as part of the national mosaic of Lebanon. So it's quite complex. Yes, of course, they listen to Iran. They coordinate with Iran, not for every attack they make, but there is clear congruence of interests and ideological affinity between Hezbollah and Iran. But Hezbollah has its own interests as well. Um, Hezbollah, just like Iran, <laughs> Iran has been shy of inviting direct confrontation with Israel. Um, Hezbollah's response to Israel has also been somewhat measured. It's getting a bit out of measure now, but initially it was measured. The number of strikes they made, the missiles they fired at uh, Israeli territory, they were just enough to annoy Israel, but not to invite direct confrontation. Because Hezbollah doesn't want to invite an Israeli invasion of Lebanon again. That is too costly for Hezbollah. And it could, in fact, be a politically very costly for Hezbollah if they did engage in direct confrontation and warfare. So it's a complex picture. Iran is obviously trying to manage all these different moving pieces on the chessboard, not always being in control of what happens where. So we've talked about now the Houthis, we've talked about Hezbollah, then there's also Iraq. Uh, Neighbouring Iraq, there are several separate militant groups that make common cause in their resistance to the US military presence in the country. They sometimes go under the umbrella name of Islamic resistance in Iraq. As with the Houthis, the Iraq-based militant groups have been in the news since the start of the Israel-Gaza conflicts with their attacks on US bases in Iraq. So, Andrew... Who are these militant groups? What are their goals? And how are they tied to Iran? So um, there is a a mosaic of these sort of militant groups in Iraq. There's the Badr organization, Kataib Hezbollah al-Haq, and then Harakat Hezbollah al-Najoba as well. They all are Shia groups that have a very similar view of the Walid al-Fahi, But they all start at different points. So the Badr organization is much older, for example, uh, has a history of opposition to Saddam's Ba'athist rule, 
And then there are newer ones that sort of came to light after 2003. What's quite interesting in the context of the funding of Iraqi militants, it's also important to note that Iraq is majority Shia. It's one of the few states in the Middle East that is actually a majority Shia state in terms of its sort of sectarian makeup. And Saddam Hussein, if you look at Iraq in a sectarian context, was actually minority sectarian rule like Syria was, but the reverse, Sunni ruling Shia. Iran attempted to exploit that during the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, funding not just uh, Shia groups, but also Kurdish groups. And that evolved after the 2003 invasion of Iraq to sort of undermine the new vision that the US had for a democratic Iraq. It's also really important to juxtapose Iran's relationship between the United States after 9-11 and after 2003, where Iran actually conducted under Mahmoud Khatami intelligence sharing with the United States about al-Qaeda in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and all across the region. Now, some people would hear that and think, what? That makes no sense. But it comes down to a, but the government of Muhammad Khatami was about sort of pseudo reconciliation with the Western world in a lot of ways, at least rhetorically, but also this forward defense strategy, which actually included the United States, which is bizarre, I know, but it did happen. What then happened was Iran gets labeled as a member of the axis of evil by the Bush administration. And there's a pivot towards how the United States and Iran view themselves again and sort of starts to clash. You then get the election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and a solidifying of this relationship as enemies once again. So these groups, there's two roles. One is to disrupt US interests in Iraq. And two is to sort of foster a Shia political presence in Iraq. One that specifically is allied to Iranian interests. Sharam, how does Iran manage these relationships? There are so many organizations, groups spread across so many parts of the Middle East. Is it financial? Is it entirely based around weapons exchanges? What exactly are the practical tools used to maintain, manage, massage, and even develop some of these ongoing relationships that currently exist? So um, the simple answer is we don't know because these things are not publicized. They're all state secrets, but reports that we have seen suggest that in places like Iraq, where Iran has a lot of influence, there is, of course, funding, so fund transfer, as well as training and um, supply of weaponry. Those are obviously true in uh, places like Iraq and in Syria as well, of course. With Hezbollah, same. And you have to see the land passage through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon that really serves Iranian interest and Iranian support for its various proxy actors. In other places like uh, the Houthis in Yemen, it's difficult to know how much technology is being transferred now because of the blockade. There could be funds transferred to the Houthis. There could be knowledge transferred through, you know, individuals going over, somehow managing to get through the blockade. I understand that small boats can break through the blockade and actually get to the shore. But it's difficult to know the exact volume and exact amount of support. What is true is, and uh, we have to add this to the picture, just another layer of complexity, and that is. This is Iranian defense policy of supporting proxies, which it sees as being defensive and a deterrent for attacks. The Iranian public has a very different view on this, and it needs to be noted, needs to be put on record. The Iranian public sees Iranian investment in Hezbollah, in Hamas, as counterproductive and detrimental to Iranian national interests. So there have been a number of public events. I saw a video of a public meeting at Tehran University where the panel discussed why 
Iran should not invest in Hezbollah and Hamas because that's just damaging Iranian interests, especially when Iran is under sanctions and needs the money for its own economy. So there is a clear gap between the public and the Iranian leadership that pursues these proxy relationships. So has Iran then ever regretted its use of this approach? Not to my knowledge. I don't think there has been any case like that. We started with the case of the Taliban and Pakistan, and that is so true. Pakistani leaders must be questioning their judgment about supporting the Taliban. I don't think that has been the case with Iran and its proxies. I would say that it's never come to that point. The risks are calculated risks when it comes to funding these groups. Though I would say that the assassination of Qasem Soleimani really brought home to Iran how much it is playing with fire. The weeks and months after that were quite tense. Remember that Iran accidentally shot down a passenger aircraft because it thought it was a US bomber coming in. Now, we could also have another discussion about how smart killing Qasem Soleimani was, you know, from the Trump administration's perspective and why previous presidents had had the opportunity to kill him and didn't take it, largely because it was quite escalatory. It's the equivalent of killing a defense minister for another nation. Wars have started for a lot less. But what's now been made clear to Iran is that the stakes are actually a lot higher in its activity. That doesn't mean that it's reconsidering its approach. This is the only way it sees it can exercise its foreign influence in a direct manner. But the killing of Soleimani brought home exactly how close its activities in other countries can bring war to its doorstep again. And it's also worth mentioning that the memory of the Iran-Iraq war is very, very strong in Iran's mind, and particularly the Iranian people. As Sharam alluded to before, there's only really a generation separating people who lived through that conflict, and they see the funding of external groups as potentially bringing war to Iran again. So let's then do one final look at the entire region. We've got various armed conflicts underway in the Middle East in 2024. Yet, would it be fair to say that each and every one involves a proxy military force guided by a state actor that itself has not declared war? Is that a safe assumption, Sharam? Let me just start by saying that from Iranian point of view, their investment in proxies have served their interests well. And this goes back to the point that Andrew was making. When Iran called for a mobilization of Shia forces and the creation of a united force to push back against ISIS, that was in response to the Islamic State in 2014 moving from Syria into Iraq, taking over Mosul and sending Iraqi army on its way, you know, packing to Baghdad. Mosul fell because the Iraqi army was unable to withstand the ISIS attack. Iran responded by saying, let's mobilize a popular force of all Shia groups, come together and push ISIS out. Within two years, Basically, Iran managed to help the recapture of Mosul, freeing of Mosul from ISIS. So from that point of view, the Iranian strategy of supporting proxies to counter threats worked because ISIS was going to come to Iran. That was the narrative. ISIS captured Mosul and they were on their way to fight Iranian forces on Iranian soil. ISIS, you will remember, was a vehemently anti-Shia group. They had a very <laughs> pronounced anti-Shia ideology. So does this mean that all states are now looking at proxy wars as the norm? I don't know if that is true, but Proxies have definitely shown to be an effective way of promoting and advancing national interests. So I would not be surprised if other actors in the region, 
also looked at this option. The qualification I have to make is that Iran is an outlayer. Iran has been challenging international norms on many occasions. And for Iran, it's a lot easier to engage in proxy warfare because it sees the international system as being unjust and skewed to benefit the arrogant superpower, the United States, the great Satan. So it's not going to be that easy for Saudi Arabia and other countries that have the more, if you like, normal states that have more of affinity and more of a declared commitment to international rules to then engage in proxy war. Andrew, do you agree? Is this uh, Iran uniquely poised and uniquely talented, some might argue, at proxy warfare? Well, yeah, I mean, they're doing it. They've certainly had practice, that's for sure. More practice than literally any other state. Um, but it's also important to to mention, not to get too philosophical, but what we mean by proxy. I mean, we're really talking about sub-state actors, and we're talking about it in terms of legitimacy. We're talking about actors that are seen as illegitimate, non-sovereign actors undermining other states. But it's quite clear that states can be proxies too, and that states have proxy interests that have the same risks associated with them. I mean, look at what's happening between the US and Israel right now. The US would like nothing more than Israel to restart a political dialogue with the Palestinian Authority and get moving on a two-state solution. However, it can't do that. It can't control its proxy because really the way that the national security establishment in the United States sees Israel is a proxy for US interests, a satellite of a democracy, one that fights for its values in the region. Um, but quite clearly, that's blowing up in their face right now because they're sending defense ministers over there and saying, well, actually, this scorched earth strategy that you're employing in Gaza right now is actually counterproductive to a counterterrorism movement. Believe me, we have experience as the United States in poor counterterrorism. We've tread this road before you. This isn't going to work. Proxy interests are everywhere. It's just this is a very kind of specialized, shall we say, you could use that word revisionist again, but based on exactly what Shahram said, which is that Iran works outside the international norms of the region because it sees them as illegitimate. And it says, well, the United States doesn't play by the rules when it doesn't suit them. Well, it doesn't suit us. So we're going to cause a ruckus by funding these groups and by undermining the interests of other other nations. And also prove it was us. You can't. That's It's win-win. We focus so much on the Middle East. Does Iran's proxy network extend beyond the Middle East? You mentioned places like Pakistan and Afghanistan have come up in our conversation, but not with regards to Iran's proxy situation. Are there more regions in the world where Iran has influence that we don't talk about enough? Sharam? Iran is looking into Africa as a new frontier. To what extent that qualifies as proxy relations, I am not sure. That remains to be an open question for us to perhaps to come back to in the next episode. Any further spoilers you want to give us for part two, Andrew? Yeah, I think that you can see Iran's sort of diplomatic tendrils reaching beyond the region, for sure. I mean, you can just see that it's clearly doubling down its relationship with Russia, and particularly when it comes to arms sales and the sale of drones. But to sort of say that that's going to translate into any kind of proxy activity is sort of putting the cart before the horse a bit. International politics is really quite opaque at the best of times, but this is, we're really talking about like clandestine operations here. Who knows? They could be, they could be fostering proxy groups in Latin America. I mean, I doubt it, but it's entirely possible that Iran is looking far beyond the region to foster its relationships, but we'll have to see. We'll see in part two, as Sharam has mentioned. I hope you will both come back for that. Our guests have been Professor Sharam Akbarzadeh, Research Professor of Middle East and Central Asian Politics at Deakin University, and international relations expert Dr. Andrew Thomas, also from Deakin University. Thank you both. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks so much, Sammy. I really enjoyed the conversation.
Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 3rd of April 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Param of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.